from God's people on this beautiful Sabbath morning here in New York City in the Community Worship Center of Seventh-day Adventists here in Queens, New York. Beautiful, beautiful Sabbath morning. The sun is shining out. And it is a day we don't have to go to work. It's a day we can rest and fellowship and worship our Lord all day long. This is the Sabbath School Hour. Our superintendent of Sabbath School here is Sister Jack, Sister Pertidon Jack, and you don't see her. She is always behind the scene, but nevertheless, our superintendent of Sabbath School here. Today, we pause to take another look at the study of God's Word. We have been in the book of Genesis. We're just about getting out of it, and I hope that by now we have uncovered some things that we didn't know before. To help us to do that today on our panel, we have uh, Brother Wilson over here. Glad to have him joining us, and Brother Doyle all the way to the end there. Dr. Woods is with us. Oh, we can't go wrong today. We have some heavy panelists, and we're happy to have you join us as we review. We have just about a half an hour. We won't study the lesson in that half an hour. What we do is we simply do a review for a half an hour in uh, our lesson study this morning. So, loving Father, we thank you so much for entrusting us with the Bible. Thank you, Lord, for what we have uncovered as we studied and we learned new things of your will. Please come now, Lord, bring back to our minds the precious gems that we have uncovered. As we discuss your words, be the unseen guest to our table. This we ask in the precious name of Jesus, our Savior and friend. Amen and amen. amen. Subject of our lesson this morning, Joseph, Prince of Egypt. We're talking about Joseph, the Prince of of Egypt. Our member verse Genesis 41 and 41 from the New King James Version. Let's say it together, and I know that you all know it from memory. Let's say it together. It says, And Pharaoh said to Joseph, See, I have set you over all the land of Egypt. Oh, I wish that was me. See, I have set you. That is the Pharaoh speaking. Egypt was the most civilized society in that particular era of time, most developed nation. Pharaoh was revered. As a matter of fact, he thought himself a god. You had several pharaohs. One of them asked the question, who is God that I should obey him? But then this one had a dream. And I noticed as we studied this week's lesson, all of what took place there with the Joseph and Pharaoh and all of these men, I noticed that the Lord was leading in every aspect of that program. It was God's doing in all of it. He was leading up to something special. You see, Satan decided that the name of God was to be blotted out from among men. And God decides that his name is to remain in the earth. The great controversy is going on. Israel had the name of God. Children of Israel, the Lord entrusted his oracles to them. All that he wanted the world to know, he entrusted it to the Jews. But now the Jews decided to disappoint the Lord, and do all sorts of wrong things, turn away from the Lord. And the Lord was about to send them into captivity in order to preserve his name in the earth. And for him to do that, he had to send them into Egyptian captivity. And 
And that was done for over 430 years in Egypt. But before they went to Egypt, Joseph was sent by God to prepare the way, not just for his father and the famine and all that existed in the land of uh, Canaan and all of that, but then Joseph was to prepare the way for his family and also prepare the way for the children of Israel that was to come later. And that took place. And the day came when Joseph was about to die. He says, take my body with you back to Canaan. And it was done. Praise the Lord for that. Now then, here we have Joseph. He went to Egypt to prepare the way. How did he get there? Well, one day he elderly told his brothers, he said, look here, man. I had a dream, and my dream told me that you're going to bow down to me. Now, that's not nice. That kind of set those brothers off now. One of the things that we observe in our Sabbath school lesson is that these patriarchs, they made some great big mistakes, big errors. They started showing favoritism to the children. Elder, that's dangerous business, isn't it? It's very, very. It's provocation. Joseph showed favoritism. Isaac showed favoritism. Isaac loved Esau, right? And he said, Esau, I like what you do. You go uh, get some venison and all. Cause Rachel loved uh, Jacob and all the rest of that. And that teach me, taught me in the Sabbath school lesson. Oh, you have children in your home, more than one. One of them might be so nice to you in the kitchen, mom willing to help you and so on and so forth. And you have an affinity to that one. You have a drawing and that one is drawn to you. And there is a tender feeling. And there is the tendency to show love to that one. You forget that the others are looking. Can we learn a lesson from that part of our lesson today? Joseph made, Isaac made that mistake. Jacob made that mistake. Joseph himself made that mistake. When Benjamin came there, he gave Benjamin a whole lot of food that he didn't give the others. Five times more. Yeah. That's something that, and what that it cause problems. We as God's people have to know how to balance the level. God loves us all. And so the boys with all of the venom that they had in them took that brother and threw him in a pit. Ellen White says they put that boy in there so later on they would come back and kill him. But then Reuben says no killing. Judah says no killing. Kill me and let him go free. Now that is something like what Jesus did, isn't it? Amen. That part of the lesson taught me what Judah did there was what Jesus did for it. Take me, Lord, and set them free. But somehow the understanding was, okay, we will, we will sell them to the Egyptian. Sell him to the Egyptian, right? And the merchants came along and Joseph was sold to Egypt. And you know the story pretty well. God was guiding. Joseph ended up in a palace in, in Pharaoh's, in a, what's his name? Pharaoh? In Pharaoh's, Potiphar's house. Potiphar. With that wife of Potiphar in there, giving him all sorts of problems. But Joseph was quality. He had quality, the qualities of God in him. How can I do this wicked thing and sin against my God? And the end product, Joseph ended up in prison. You watch the steps. God leads us in various ways. He's 
leading him to Egypt. And uh, I looked way down, we'll get back to that, but I look way down the Sabbath school lesson. And I see the boys visiting with Joseph, talking with Joseph, talking their language around the table as if Joseph did not understand what they were saying. They didn't know he, they didn't even know who he was. Funny language. Well, Joseph knew exactly, and that was proving to them, to Joseph, that whether they were serious or not, did they really repent? And the Lord revealed that they certainly did repent. But the others, Elder, Elder, Elder Woods is going to take us through that part, but I was so impressed with that. Now the question is, have you ever done anything in your life when you was in power that you wish today that you did not do that way? When you were in power, you wield power. I say so. But today, when you look back at it, did you reach the place where you wish you didn't? Anybody has that experience? so very often. This was the experience with those brothers. They had power over Joseph. And they throw him, uh, throw him in a pit. But now Joseph is the boss. Prime Minister Joseph and you're sitting before me. I got the life in hand. I heard an old preacher said one time, he says, when people bother you, you let them trouble you and then one day they're going to fall in your hand. And then when they fall in your hand, you nail them. I said, I don't know. I said, brother preacher, I don't know that. That's what you want to do. But there comes a time when they fall right in your hand. And what do you do that time? You do, should do what Joseph did, didn't you? He forgave them. From his heart, he forgave them. But he tested them properly to find that they really had repented of their sin. Let's follow that example. Because of the experience that Jacob had been through with Joseph, he could not easily allow the, the, the departure of Benjamin, his only son, with Rachel, who remained with him. He was afraid that he would lose him, as he already had lost Joseph. It was only when there was no more food and when Judah pledged to guarantee the return of Benjamin, that Jacob finally consented to send Benjamin to Egypt and allow Benjamin to go with his brothers. Benjamin's presence dominated the events. When all the brothers stood before Joseph, Benjamin is the only person that he really saw. Benjamin is the only one who is called brother. While Benjamin is called by name, all the other brothers are not identified. They are simply referred to as men. Joseph calls Benjamin my son as a reassuring expression of special affection. Joseph returns to Benjamin the grace that he did not receive from his brothers. Joseph prepares a banquet for them because Benjamin is in their presence. It is as if Benjamin has a redeeming effect on the whole situation when all the brothers are seated according to their ages and respecting the rules of honor. It is Benjamin, the youngest, who is served five times more than all the other brothers. And yet, this favoritism does not bother them, unlike when Joseph was his father's favorite many years before. 
which led to their terrible actions towards both half-brothers and their own father. By this token of f favoritism to Benjamin, he hoped to ascertain if the youngest brother was regarded with the same envy and hate that had been manifested towards himself. Still, he desired to test them further, and before their departure, he ordered that his own drinking cup of silver would be concealed in the sack of the youngest. Now, as before, Joseph gives specific instructions, and once again, he fills the man's sacks with food. This time, however, Joseph adds the strange command to put his precious cup in Benjamin's sack. The events take place, therefore, a different course. Whereas in the present, in the preceding situation, all the brothers found the same thing in their sacks. Now Benjamin is singled out. I'm sorry. Benjamin is singled out as the one who has ac accessibility to jo Joseph's cup. Unexpectedly, Benjamin, who as the, the guest of honor, had access to Joseph's cup, is now suspect and charged with having stolen that precious article, he will go to prison. Joseph was using a divination cup, not that he believed in its power, but was willing to have them believe that he could read the secrets of their lives. The magic cup was for Joseph's pretext to invoke the supernatural domain and thus awaken in their brothers' hearts their sense of guilt towards God. This is how Judah interprets Joseph's implied message because he refers to the iniquity that God has found in them. That cup. As, I hear a cup. Yes. Where did that cup come from? A cup in one of the containers going back over to Dad and Benjamin's house. And Joseph put valuable cup. Servant of the Lord says that cup could have cost Benjamin his life. You know, uh, not only would he be placed in prison, but it could have, uh, Joseph would have ordered his death. That's a serious cup, a cup of divination. Not that he believed in, in, in spiritualism with the cup, but that's the king's cup. Well, I think the, the, the test was for the brothers to see what they would do, to see if in the 20 years since they sent him away to to slavery, basically, if, you know, if they had changed, if God had actually touched their hearts. And he, and he saw that they did, and he believed that basically at that point in time that, yes, he can trust them once more and welcome them back into his family. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen for that. Yeah. Mr. Duff, I wanted to ask a question now. Sure. It, it seems to me that sometimes human beings, as human beings, we make mistakes. Mm -hmm. But God always seems to work with us, even Hallelujah. in our mistakes. Bless the Lord. Now, Joseph had his dream. Um, we believe it's not always the best thing to tell people your dreams because it got him into a whole lot of trouble, right? Mm -hmm. Now, do you, it's a speculative question. Do you think if he had not told him his dream that um, things would have turned out um, good for Joseph also? <laughs> it, it's a sort of speculative question, but what, what is your idea? Does God accomplish his purpose regardless to what happens to us? Well, if that was not done this way, the whole story would be different. Right. But, but would Joseph 
you think he would have still been the savior of Egypt and um, well, you think God no, would have found a different we, we way? We can't speculate. <laughs> That's <laughs> we, right. <laughs> we, we can't speculate as to what Joseph would do, right. what would happen. But to see in the midst of that, the Lord was guiding. Okay. And the will of the Lord will always be done. Right. Amen. It's all God's providence. Yes, and we as a people need to place ourselves in, in, in a way that the Lord can use you. That is what God did. All of what took place there, it was God's doing. But he was using Joseph, Jacob, Isaac, all of them to accomplish his will. Amen. Amen. But I'm, under, I'm of the impression that Joseph would not have changed because when he went through each of his trials, he stayed the same. With Potiphar's wife, in prison, with the Pharaoh, he did not change. He stayed steady. He followed the commandments. He remained loyal. He remained well, he was Lord. of a different character than all the other brothers. Mm -hmm. So um, his mannerism would be the same. But uh, the, uh, the, the fact that... Um, this turned out to be just as it did was then God himself directing yes, that, uh, that uh, amen. scenario. Amen. Amen. Okay. They all are united in the same pain, fearing for Benjamin, who would be lost as Joseph. And like him, before... Be, uh, to become a, a slave in Egypt, although he was, like him, innocent. This is why Judah purposes that he be taken as a slave instead of, instead of Benjamin. Just as the ram had been sacrificed instead of the innocent Isaac. We read this in Genesis 22, 13. Judah presents himself as a sacrifice, a substitute, whose purpose is precisely to cope with that evil that would devastate his father. As soon as there was sin, there was a savior. Christ knew that he would have to suffer, yet he became man's substitute. As soon as Adam sinned, the Son of God presented himself as a surety for the human race. I have graven thee upon the palms of my hands. The palms of his hands bear the marks of the wounds that he received. If we are wounded and bruised, if we meet with difficulties that are hard to manage, let us remember how much Christ suffered for us. What love is this? What marvelous, unfathomable love that would lead Christ to die for us while we were yet sinners. We were yet sinners. The Bible has little to say in praise of men. Little space is given to recounting the virtues of even the best men who have ever lived. This silence is not without purpose. All the good qualities that men possess are the gifts of God. Their good deeds are performed by the grace of God through Christ. Since they owe all to God, the, the glory of whatever they are or do belongs to him alone. They are but instruments in his hands. It is a perilous thing to praise or exalt men. For if one comes to lose sight of his entire dependence on God, he is sure to fall. Man is contending with foes who are stronger than he. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against wicked spirits, in high places, Ephesians 6, 12. Whatever leads to exalt, exaltation of self-dependence is sure preparing a way for overthrow. 
Now that you have given yourself to Jesus, do not draw back yourself away from him. But day by day, say, I am Christ. I have given myself to him and ask him to give you his spirit and keep you by his grace. All right. Amen. Thank you for that, Elder. Yes. I have a question, Dr. Um, Goff. Um, uh, do you think there's a reason that God um, allows the, the sacred men, the men who wrote the Bible, to make a record of all the despicable acts, all our mistakes? Do you think the Bible would have been better if it had omitted some of the, these uh -huh. things? Well, that's the wonderful thing about the Bible. The Bible tells you the way it was, the way it is, what happened, good, bad, and indifference. Yeah. Tells you everything. You must determine truth from error. Mm. That's the, uh, thank God for the, the Bible. It is God's word, the living word of God. And these are recorded. See, this lesson as we study here, it's a, it's, it's a story. And we all know the story. From, we are going to school. We learn the story of Joseph. But our lesson is prepared to teach us something. There are some lessons we draw from the experience of Joseph and the, what he had. Yeah. Yes, okay. So, Pastor Goff, as I was studying the lesson, uh, the thing that resonated with me the most was that um, I, I saw Joseph as um, a, a person who mirrored uh, Jesus Christ in a way. Mm. You see, it's all well and good to study the Bible from a, from a historical perspective, but every passage in the Bible is Christ-centered. And I, I, as I was studying the life of Joseph, there's certain threads of commonality that ran in the life of Joseph and that of Jesus. And I'd like to make reference to those. Um, first of all, Joseph was sent by his father to his brothers. Now, now in the life of Joseph, um, those things apply locally and nationally. Um, in the sense of Jesus Christ, the universal application Right? So Joseph, in a way, is a type. It's, it's a figure of Jesus Christ, just as the Lama was a figure, uh, just as Isaac was a figure, Moses. All these entities were figures of Jesus Christ. So Joseph was sent by his father to his brothers. On the other hand, Jesus was sent by God to the world. As a matter of fact, Jesus Christ was a lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Right. Secondly, um, Joseph was favored by his father. Jesus was favored by his father also. He said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Now, J Joseph was hated by his own. His own brothers um, uh, conspired to, to slay him. Jesus was rejected by his own. Right? So that's another thread of commonality that runs there. Um, the Bible says, he came unto his own, and his own received him not. Um, Joseph was betrayed by his brothers. He was sold for 20 pieces of silver. Jesus was betrayed by his king's folk, and he was betrayed ultimately by Judas. He was sold for 30 pieces of silver. So that's another similarity. Now, Joseph was stripped of his robe. Jesus was also divested of his robe when he hung on the cross. Okay. Um, both of these men resisted severe temptations. Joseph resisted the temptation of complying with the wishes of Mrs. Potiphar. You know, and I wonder how many uh, virtuous young men can stand the test of, you know, of, um, you know, being seduced by a woman. That's a very dangerous one, right, Brother Doyle? <laughs> right. Um, I think right at, right at that spot, Elder. Yes. I read somewhere where Ellen White says, Mr. Potiphar did not believe a word. Exactly. Miss Potiphar said. Otherwise, she would be killed. But she, that's right. But then, he, uh, politically, he had to send Joseph to prison. Yes, yes. Okay. So, the, the other one that I want to think about is that both of them resisted temptations. Neither of them yielded. Christ was tempted in the wilderness. He quoted the word of God. He said, this is what the Bible says. It is written. 
So that's the lesson for us there that when we're tempted, we can refer back to the Bible, but we have to know the Bible. Now, both of them were prisoners, right? Joseph, from a prisoner, he became a prince. Jesus Christ was crucified, and he became the prince of this world. As a matter of fact, he's king of kings and lord of lords, right? Joseph was the savior of Egypt. Jesus is the savior of the world. There is no other door, there is no other name given a moment whereby we can be saved. It's only through Jesus, right? He is the only door. Um, Joseph pro provided bread for a nation. Jesus is the bread of life Amen. sent down from heaven. Amen. And unless we eat of that bread and drink of his blood, we have no part with him. Joseph was united with his father. Jesus united with his father after his resurrection. He sits on the right hand of God. And he says, all power is given to me in heaven and in earth. Right? The other one that I want to draw reference to is that his brothers bowed down to him, Dr. Goff. His dreams came true. Mm -hmm. They said, behold, a dreamer. Well, ultimately, they bowed. The Bible says that to Christ, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Lord. Right? That's another similarity. Joseph forgave his brothers. Jesus also is a great forgiver. He says, if you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. No matter, he says, when we were yet sinners, when we were fornicating, when we were stealing and lying and shagging up, Jesus came and died for our sins. Okay? It's not when we were coming to church with our Bibles and our armor. Okay? It's when we were out there. So if there's someone here today who thinks that they have done the worst and God cannot save you, oh, the devil is a liar. Now, the last one that I want to draw reference to is that Joseph reaped a harvest of corn. Christ would reap a harvest of souls. And that one is yet to come. And the songwriter says, oh, there'll be joy when the work is done. Joy when the reapers gather home, bringing the sheaves at set of sun to the new Jerusalem. Joy, joy, there'll be joy by and by. Let me hear you, sister. Joy where the joy never dies. Joy, joy for the day when the workers gather home. The song says again, will you be in that number when the sins go marching on? I would love to sing one of these days, Dr. Goff. Redeemed how I love to proclaim it. Redeemed by the blood of the land. So as I look at the life of Joseph, I see through his life to the life of Christ. Okay, so as I studied the lesson, for historical purposes, it was nice. But I saw through the lesson to the greater person, Jesus Christ, whom the life of Joseph prefigured. Okay? Thank you, doctor. Amen. Oh. Oh, you could, you could preach that one right there now. Yes, sir. But there the time came when the boys gathered around the table. Everybody is sitting down, Benjamin, Joseph. And Joseph is still in disguise. The prime minister of Egypt is sitting around the table. And the boys are sitting around there. And, uh, you know, they started that language stuff. And, and Joseph is listening. And they figure he doesn't know what they're saying. That, uh, you know, my father taught me that thing. He says, boy, if you're standing at a place and people are talking language that you don't understand, move. You never know what they're saying. They might be trying to kill you. Move. Get away from there. That was Joseph's experience. He was sat there. The prime minister sat down. He was their brother. They didn't know it. And they started talking that funny language. Jo Joseph was just simply reading every word they were saying. But Ellen White says that taught Joseph that they were really sincere in their repentance. Yes. Doctor, one more point I want to bring. Joseph was not afraid to sit in the presence of kings because he has sat at the feet of whom? Hallelujah. The King of kings and Lord of lords. Oh, yes. yes and sir. so when we sit at the feet of Jesus, we will not be afraid to stand in front of anyone. Yes. 
And uh, at the, as the evening wore on, Joseph says, Boys, I am your brother Joseph. Can you imagine the boys say, well, yeah, yeah, I know, yeah. You sure is Joseph. Huh? Whom you sold into Egypt. But now the brother, prime minister has to muscle up. He says, I am Joseph, your brother, who you sold into Egypt. Hey! What? What a discovery. And with tears in his eyes. You know, I learned if you study a little bit more in the lesson, it says, those boys were afraid of death. They were afraid to die. I watched, I watched uh, uh, that fellow who did all that killing on television there and went to the church to, uh, to, to kill somebody and kill those people at, prime, at a prayer meeting. When he came outside at the door, he stood up and he looked up and down the street. I said, what are you looking for? You just killed 10 people in there and you're looking to see who's going to kill you? That's the problem. This, they were not afraid to toss Joseph down in that pit, in, in that pit and kill him. But they themselves were afraid to die. But then the mercy of God kicked in. As the elder says... What Jesus does. We deserve death, but God forgives. And all you need to do is to tell the Lord, I'm sorry for the way I have lived in the past. Here I am now, Lord. Take me, accept me, and let me be your servant. That is all the Lord asks us for. He forgives us of our sins and forget the past. A brand new creature in Christ. And you will be living with the hope. When Jesus comes again, you will be saved in his kingdom. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Oh, we've studied a rather challenging lesson through this quarter. Let us be faithful. They were intended to teach us what God has in store for his children. Continue to study. We have just about one lesson left in, uh, in this quarter. And then we will go on to the next quarter. In the, the word Genesis means beginning. So we are in the beginning of the Bible. Let us study. Father, thank you so much for what we have learned from the Bible as we studied this week. We ask you, Lord, that you would help us to be faithful to you. Help us to implement these things in our lives because they are in the Bible to help us to obey your will. We pray your blessings upon your children now. Keep us faithful. Save us when the work is finished. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Lord bless you. Amen. Those of you who are online, we'll see you on next Sabbath, same time, at the same place. God bless you. Dads are special. They're a daughter's first love and a son's first hero. They rocked us in their strong arms when we were babies, held our small hands on the first day of school, and blinked back tears when they let us go after dropping us off at college or walking us down the aisle. So much of who we are and who we will become is because of Dad. His impact will last as long as we live. It's hard to be a good dad. So this Father's Day, be thankful for yours. Squeeze his hand or give him a call just to tell him thanks, to tell him you love him, to tell him you're glad that he's your dad. In six days, God created the heavens and the earth. For thousands of years, man has worshiped God on the seventh day of the week. Now, each week, millions of people worship on the first day. What happened? Why did God create a day of rest? Does it really matter what day we worship? Who is behind this great shift? Discover the truth behind God's law and how it was changed. Visit SabbathTruth.com.
Wrapped his body and sealed up the grave So I know how you feel His death was so real But please listen and hear what I say
The tempter stalks about me as a lion, searching for the slightest sense of blood. For when the skin of my resistance is broken, he moves in swiftly the deep and the good. Oh, Lord of creation, Hear your servant, you understand the weakness of man. I'm counting myself crucified with Jesus, alive to Christ, but dead indeed to sin. Yes, this temple that you dwell in. 
of Almighty God sent from his heavenly throne given to reign over kings and priests the sin of man to atone the Messiah will return the hour unknown to man a fanfare of praise will inhabit the earth as creations rejoicing in him in majesty he will come with the sound of the trumpet and the redeem in majesty he will come Jesus the Savior he Psalm 65 verse 8 says, The whole earth is filled with awe at your wonders. Where morning dawns, where evening fades, you call forth songs of joy. Today another opportunity has dawned and we have the joy to worship our Savior. He is calling each one of us to enter into a worship experience with Him. Leave behind the baggage and just enter into His presence today. Welcome and thanks for tuning in. Let's join the service that's already in progress. Zion reigneth. These oars to him belong. Oh, enter now his temple gates and fill his courts with song. Beneath his royal banner, let every creature fall. Exalt the king of heaven and earth and crown him Lord of all. Father, we have come another week, another great Sabbath together in your temple. And as we come, may you just fill our hearts with your great blessing. May you fill us to overflowing that as we worship and we praise you, we will do so in the spirit of holiness and truth. 
May you bless us. May everything that shall be said and done here today may be done to your name's honor and glory. And we'll be careful, careful to give you the honor and the praise. We ask with thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Happy Sabbath, church. Will all our fathers in church please stand today? All our fathers, please stand. Amen. Always giving good advice. For being a great teacher, being a great teacher. Like the Father in heaven. Amen. H is for being a handsome hero. Amen. E is for E, e is for being on an excellent lawnmower and spider killer. <laughs> R is for bring, being a great driver of the road and a great remote controller. Amen. Now will all our other men of the church please stand. Amen. Whether you consider yourself a stepdad, an uncle, a granddad, or a church dad, or has been a father figure in any way, we want you to know that we salute and celebrate you today. May you be an example to others and Jesus, as Jesus is our example. On behalf of our pastor, Jason Ridley, the Board of Elders and the CWC community members, welcome and have a happy Sabbath. And now for a few brief announcements, I beg your attention. Um, as you may know by now, the, our GEMS program has been established for our young ladies who are ages 10 through 21. And uh, today is the open house for the GEMS program. Everyone who is interested needs to be registered with the program. So it's immediately after the Vine service today in multi-purpose room one, and light refreshments will be served. If you have any questions, please see Sister Natalie, who just spoke to you, or um, myself, and we'll guide you in the right direction, or Sister Sarah, who is our GEMS leader. So today, immediately after service, in multi-purpose room one is registration for GEMS. Parents, you can register on behalf of your child. 
Our 4th of July barbecue. We have one every year. It's going to be on the 4th of July. Amen. <laughs> it will be at 2 p.m. on July 4th in the church parking lot. If you have any questions, please see Elder Hamilton and she will direct you. But Elder Hamilton is the person to see if you have any questions about that barbecue. And then on July 9th is our International Day. What did I say? And we know internet, CWC is the United Nations of Queens. So we know International Day for us is a major, major deal. So please make note of that date, July 9th. That Sabbath will be International Day. And we, want, we would like each group to get together at some point within, by the end of this week so that you can coordinate and, and figure out how you're going to do your presentation, what your country will look like, etc. And if you have any questions, please see Sister Mervis, and she'll give you some directions. But it is on July 9th. And then our Sabbath school picnic is on July 24th. So we have a lot of summer activities to, you know, to, to bring to you. And it, the, the picnic is going to be at Longwood Gardens in Pennsylvania. And that's July 24th. And guess what? The price has been reduced. Amen. Amen. <laughs> it's been reduced. So it's adults 55 and children 30. So please see Sister Jack if you have any questions about this. See Sister Jack to register because we have to get the bus together. So that will be on July 24th, the trip to Longwood Gardens. I thank you for your time and attention. Have a blessed day all. Happy Sabbath, church. Um, bow your heads in prayer with me. Dear God, I pray, thank you for this day. Um, and I pray that you will bless my voice and help it to um, reach the people and to bless them. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.
everything you're doing stir up the spirit of faith in me i'm open i'm willing jesus do your good work in me because this is just the Our hymn of worship will be number 286, Wonderful Words of Life. That's 286.
Amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord at this time. The beautiful, wonderful words of life. Such a beautiful hymn. It's prayer time this morning. And there's much that we need to pray about on this day. I just re received a message this morning just informing me uh, of some of the different losses that some of our members have experienced this week. And so we want to call out the names of uh, Sister Wright, who lost another relative, her cousin. Uh, Sister Heslop family, Sister Heslop and family had two sister-in-laws passed, days apart. Our own Elder Coombs here has lost her uncle. And then we remember Sister Hollis, mom. Uh, but we praise God that she came home from the hospital, amen and is recovering from her surgery. Then we want to acknowledge all of the prayer requests that come in uh, during our service online. For those who are writing in uh, prayer requests, we acknowledge those today as well. But on this Father's Day weekend as well, we want to pray a special prayer over our men, our fathers and uh, at this time, I, I want to invite all of the men uh, to come forward. And we want to pray over our men. That's the men and boys. Whether you're a father or not, we want all of our men to come down. I see, I, see my, I see some young men. Boys, I want you guys to come too. Ladies, for those who, who are willing, we invite you as well to come and, and surround the men of this church as we pray a special prayer for them today as our praise team uh, leads us now.
Father, in the name of Jesus, we come to you now. Thanking you, God, for bringing us through another week. We've had some challenges and some ups and downs along the way. But we thank you, God, for seeing us through. And right now, Father, in the name of Jesus, we come before you. God, just remembering the families in our church of those who lost loved ones this week. Sister Wright and Sister Heslop and, 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 and Elder Coombs. And God, if there are any others that I'm unaware of, God, we, we pray right now for comfort for the families. We pray, God, that you would wrap your loving, loving arms of, of care and comfort and peace uh, around them. God, we're praying that you would uh, be with them now, God, even through the dark moments and realization of the separation that comes with death. But even in the midst of this loss, God, I'm asking that you would remind each family right now of the hope that we have in Jesus. That because of his death, our death is only temporary. And God, we look forward to that day when our families who've, who've, who've been separated because of death will be reunited in the kingdom. God, we ask and pray and thank you for uh, being with Sister Hollis' mom. And we thank you, God, for bringing her through the surgery. We thank for God for the surgery being a success. And we're, God, even thanking you in advance for this recovery process. We're praying, God, that there will be no setbacks, no delays, uh, or, or, or no other issues that arise, but that she'll make a full recovery. And Father, we remember and acknowledge any prayer requests that have come in online. God, many people tune in to this service every week from all over this world, uh, but we're so thankful that no matter where they are, God, they are still within your reach. So we're praying, God, that you would move upon all of their situations, their issues, their troubles, their trials, uh, everything that may be holding and weighing them down. God, we pray for release right now in Jesus' name. God, we pray for Pastor Walter Ortiz and, and his wife, God, who I understand are both very ill uh, at this time. I don't have all of the details, but the details I do know is that you are a great healer, that you're a bomb in Gilead, that you are the great physician. So we ask God for healing right now for Pastor Ortiz and his wife. God, uh, restore the life into their bodies. Whatever it is, God, I'm praying that you would touch them in Jesus' name. And then, God, right now, as you see our men standing before you, God, we thank you for the men of this church, from the youngest to the oldest. We thank you, God, for their commitment and faithfulness to the church, but more importantly, to you. But, God, we pray right now in the name of Jesus that you would put a hedge of protection around our men. God, protect them as they, as they go about their daily routines and activities from work and home and in all the things that they have to do. God, we pray, God, that you would put a hedge of protection uh, around them. God, I pray in, in the name of Jesus that you would block uh, any schemes or any, any issues, any things that the devil wants to throw their way, God, to deter them, God, or cause them to fall by the wayside. God, I pray for the health of every young man here. God, I pray for health in their bodies. I pray, God, not just for physical health, but for emotional health and, and mental health and, and psychological health, God. And I pray for spiritual health. God, every aspect of the men's life in our church, God, we pray for healing right now in the name of Jesus. God, for our young men, our, our young boys, our teenagers, our young adults, God, I pray for a hedge of protection from any form of violence, God, any gang violence, any, any kind of school shootings or anything that could snatch their young lives away uh, in these streets. God, I, I block it right now in the name of Jesus. God, I pray for the families of these men. God, I pray for the relationship with their wives and children, God, that, that, there will be, that the bonds between their families, God, will be so strong that it will never be broken. God, we pray 
for the employment of all of these men. There may be some here, God, who are discouraged and frustrated, God, because uh, they just want to provide for their families, but they are unable to, to find employment. But God, I pray that you, for those who are working, that you would put a hand to protection uh, around their employment, God, that, they, that you would advance them on their employment, God, that they will be blessed and highly favored uh, on their job. And for those, God, who may be looking for employment, God, who are seeking direction, God, I pray that you would open up doors. And I pray that you would open up windows from heaven, God, and pour out blessings uh, upon them, God. I pray that you would enlarge their ter territory. God, that you would bless them beyond uh, that anything that they could ever imagine or think. But God, most important of all, I pray for the soul salvation of our men. God, I pray that you would help our men to stay on the battlefield until you come. That none would fall by the wayside. But our men here would stay strong in the faith. Will stay strong in the walk. Will keep their hands on the plow. And God, we thank you for this church. Thank you, God, for the women who stand by their men and support them. And I pray, God, that our families will be strengthened as a result of the faithfulness of our men here at this church. We thank you for the fathers, both fathers who are biological fathers and those who have stepped into that role. We thank you for their faithfulness, how they've served their families. And we pray this prayer, God, in Jesus' name. Let every lover of the risen Christ say amen, amen, and amen. Testament scripture will come to us this morning from the first division of the song. I'll read in your hearing from verse 1 through to 6, and I'll read from the King James Version. And it reads, 
Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water, that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. The ungodly are not so, but are like a shaft which the wind driveth away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. Our New Testament scripture reading is taken from John chapter 6, verses 41 through 46. And I'll read in your hearing. At this, the Jews began to grumble about Jesus because he had said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They were asking, is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How then can he say, I have come down from heaven? Stop grumbling among yourselves, Jesus replied. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up at the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they will all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard the Father and learned from him comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father except the one who is from God. Only he has seen the Father. Amen, amen. Let's say amen again, brothers and sisters, to the reading of God's holy word. As the hymn says, the wonderful words of life. Amen? Amen. Just very quickly, we want to thank all of you who have consistently given, amen, uh, not just in terms of your uh, tithe and offering, but those who have been giving uh, toward our special offering of evangelism, amen, amen, but we are about eight or nine thousand dollars off of the pledges that were turned in, and so we're just encouraging all of our members, we thank you for those who have given, for those who have made pledges, who have not turned in your givings yet for your pledge, we're encouraging you to do that on this day. Amen? On this Sabbath day. Remember, we're lifting this special offering for the month of June. Amen? Amen. So you know what you have pledged. We're asking you to fulfill that commitment. And for those who uh, may be joining us for the first time, even if you're tuning in online, but you want to give today to our special offering of evangelism as we're gearing up for... Uh, our summer evangelistic series here for the city of Queens that are beginning when? July 30th on that Sabbath evening we'll be kicking off, amen, as well as some other evangelistic items and things here for our church. So please, please, uh, we're asking if you want to give today those who are here for the first time, all you have to do on your tithe envelope uh, where it has the lines for local giving, you can write in Evangelism 2020 and give that way. If you want to give online with Adventist giving under the local uh, church, there's already a line that says Evangelism, and you can put your offering right there. We thank you for your support of our local church and for our conference and the worldwide church as a whole, and we just praise God for the giving of all of our members here. Thank you again. unto the Lord, for he is good, 
for his mercy endured forever. We have much to be thankful for. Our beloved, benevolent father gives us everything we are in need of and sometimes our wants. He has given to us, if nothing else, life. And if we are faithful, we will have life and have it more abundantly. Philippians 4 verse 19 says, But my God shall supply all our need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. The emphasis is on all. He will supply all our needs. So let us be faithful in giving. Let us be like grateful children. My mom used to say, ungratefulness is worse than witchcraft. And I never understood that as a child. But as I grew older, I realized that when your children are ungrateful, it hurts. And I'm quite sure that when we are not faithful in our tithes and offering, we grieve the heart of God. So let us be generous. This church has offered several ways of giving, and so it is pointed out. There are four ways to give. The first, we can give online, cwcsda.org. We can follow the instruction and go to our online giving. The next one is Zelle, cwcsda.treasurer at gmail.com. Another way of giving is through the mail. We can mail it to the Community Worship Center and the post office box is listed. Another way of giving is just to make a simple phone call, 718-276-6131. And someone will be there to answer the call, or if not, leave a message, and someone will get back to you. So you see, my friends, there are multiple ways of giving, so give generously. tied into the storehouse that there may be meat in my house and prove me now herewith said the Lord of hosts if I will not pour you out a blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it let us pray Father God we thank you for your many ways of blessing us now as we return our tithes and offering dear Lord may you use it to do your work around the world and may we receive the blessing that you have in store for us. In Jesus' name, with thanksgiving, amen.
said forever all my days So hard to see it. it took me so long to believe it that you choose someone like me to carry your victory. Perfection could never earn it. You give what we don't deserve it. You take all these broken things and raise them to glory. You are my champion. Giants fall when you stand undefeated. Every battle you've won, I am who you say I am. I am seated in the heavenly place undefeated with the one who has conquered it all. Now I can finally see it. You're teaching me how to receive it. So let all the striving see. Cause this is my victory Giants fall when you stand undefeated. Yes, God. 
Every battle you've won, I am who you say I am. You crown me with confidence. I am seated in the heavenly place, undefeated with the one who has conquered it all. When I lift my voice and shout, every wall comes crashing down i have the authority that jesus has given me Crown me with 
with confidence I am seated, yes God, in the heavenly place undefeated, with the one who has conquered it all. Aren't you glad he conquered it all? He conquered hell, death, and the grave. Yeah. He can conquer your sickness. He can conquer depression. He can conquer anxiety. He can conquer joblessness. He can conquer poverty. Aren't you glad? We serve an undefeated king. We serve an undefeated king. There's nobody greater. There's nobody stronger. There's nobody wiser. He is undefeated. If you believe that, open up your mouth and give God a praise. say hallelujah in this place. How I many you know our God has never lost a battle? And in spite of what you're going through today, you're undefeated. Not because of anything we can do in and of ourselves but because we serve a God who has never lost a battle. I mean, you know, that's why you don't look like what you've been through. That's why the three Hebrew boys could go into a fiery furnace. And not only does the fire not consume them, but when the Lord brings them out, they don't even have the smell of smoke on them. <laughs> It's, not, it's as if they were never even in the fire. But it's because our God is a God who's undefeated. So praise team, we thank you uh, just for your songs of worship today. We thank the uh, Pierre sisters and our very own Alana just blessing us uh, with the musical gifts that God has given them. So beautiful to see young people uh, who could use their voice for anything, but at a young age have decided to use their voice for the Lord. And so we praise God for that. And we just thank God for all of you, our elders, our deacons, um, just the musicians, the media team ushers everyone uh, who has uh, been involved in the service today. Especially thank you to our deaconess. Don't they look sharp today? Amen. Amen. Deaconess look sharp. You know, young ladies, we, we need some some more deaconess. not to replace the deaconess we have, but to come alongside them. Amen? 
so that they can prepare you. So when the time does come for them to, and they're ready to step aside, the church can roll on. Amen? And so, uh, young ladies, please consider that. Think about that. Pray about that. Um, in all of the positions in the church. Amen? Amen. It's so good to be, a, be here today on this uh, Father's Day Sabbath. I do want to just mention very quickly, uh, as we know, camp meeting uh, will be, uh, begin on next Sabbath. Amen? Amen. And we're praying uh, for safe traveling mercies for those who will be traveling up uh, for the day or for the weekend. We do want you to be aware, however, that our church will be open. I will be here uh, on next Sabbath for those who are remaining uh, behind. Um, uh, so we will have worship here uh, on next Sabbath. I'm also aware, and we're uh, trying to work some things out. Uh, so it was brought to my attention on last Sabbath that uh, we do have quite a few of our seniors who, who, are, who want to go to camp meeting, and so we're trying to work out a way uh, to provide transportation for our seniors uh, so that they can uh, be a part of camp meeting uh, as well. Amen? Amen. But then on Sunday, on next Sunday, what day did I say? When you return from camp meeting, those who are still here, we want to invite you to join us beginning at 7 a.m. What time did I say? For our church cleanup. Amen. Amen. We want to just, God, we've been blessed with a beautiful uh, facility here, but we want to spend some extra time tidying up the place on next Sunday. Amen. Amen. So, brothers and sisters, we need you to be here. We're going to serve brunch on that day, so we're not going to starve you. Uh, but please, uh, be here on next Sunday uh, as we'll do our church uh, cleanup. And I do want to make mention as well, uh, with the cleanup means that there are going to be some things that are going to be thrown away and some things that are going to be donated. Now, there's a very nice jacket that's been hanging up in my office since I got here in January. It's a leather jacket. I don't know who that belongs to. But I've been patient. But that jacket has about one more week of life expectancy <laughs> here at CWC. So if you are missing a leather jacket, it's black, it's stylish. Please remove that before next Sunday, amen? amen. Or else it's going to look really good on someone uh, who picked it up from the thrift store, all right? So please, please, brothers and sisters, make sure that you, uh, if you have anything laying around here that does not belong to the church, particularly an item of clothing, please make sure you get it, amen? Amen. On this Father's Day uh, Sabbath, as we celebrate our fathers, we do want to uh, just be mindful of those who are hurting during this time, uh, those in particular who may have lost their father uh, in this past year. And this may be their first Father's Day without their father. Uh, you, you are not lost on our minds, and we want you to know that we are praying for you uh, during this time. Amen? Amen. Uh, amen. I, for me personally... Um, so on last year, my, of course, my daughter was born on June the 7th. So last year, I celebrated uh, my first Father's Day as a father. Um, but on this year, um, this is my first Father's Day knowing who my father is. Unfortunately, um, I did not get a chance to meet him um, because in finding out who my father was, did not know his name, never met the family, uh, I did find out as well that he passed when I was around the age of six uh, in a car accident uh, at the age of 27. Um, but it is good to know at least to now know a name and have a face. And, and God has blessed me actually to, to 
meet my aunts uh, and uncles. So I, I met met the family. Found out I have a, actually have a younger another younger sister as well. Um, but but we thank God for family. And, and one of my aunts actually, and so if she's watching today, my aunt Brenda, uh, she actually tunes in uh, just about every every Sabbath. Um, and so hi, aunt Brenda, if you're tuning in. Um, but nonetheless, we praise God, amen, uh, for just being uh, an awesome God. Um, and, and I share that because I know there are others who may have grown up like me, but hey, God is still with us, amen, uh, and he blesses us. So we praise God uh, for that. I, let's, let's stand as we go to the word of God to the book of Psalms, chapter 37, and verse 23. Psalms chapter 37, verse 23. When you have it, let the church say amen. The word says, the steps of a good man. What kind of man? are ordered by the Lord, and he delighteth in his way. Read that again. The steps of a good man are ordered by who? The Lord, and he delighteth in his way. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord as we consider for just a few moments a few good men. A few good men. Bow your heads with me now. Father, in the name of Jesus. Speak to our hearts now like only you can. Use me as the anointed manservant to speak words of life in this sanctuary. It's our prayer in Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen, and amen. Not only is tomorrow Father's Day, but it's also Juneteenth. And as we celebrate Juneteenth tomorrow, uh, commemorating the emancipation of enslaved African Americans in this country, and then some of the countries that you, co you come from here today, it, it happened at other dates. But this day, Juneteenth, is specifically in this country. But As we're commemorating the emancipation of enslaved African Americans, while at the tame, same time being cognizant and aware of the reality of how this country operates when it comes to some of its citizens, in particularly for the descendants of ex-slaves, brothers and sisters, we're reminded of just how far we've come, but yet how far we still have to go to experience true equality in this country. But on this Father's Day weekend, Juneteenth celebration weekend, when you think of the negative impact that slavery had on people from the African diaspora, and there are many negative impacts because through the transatlantic slave trade, our people lost their names, lost their culture, lost their history, and lost their languages. A few years ago, and, and this is what helped me find my family. A few years ago, I did my ancestry DNA. And the results showed that aspects of my DNA were consistent with the DNA found from the people in the countries of Nigeria, Mali, Cameroon, Benin and Togo, Ivory Coast, Ghana, and Senegal. But I can't tell you which country I would be from because my history, lineage, has been lost. Now, I'll be honest now, it, it wasn't just 
African in my DNA. Now, there was some Scottish and in, in Irish as well. I'll be honest. There was some Scottish and Irish in there as well. So if I come on International Day with some bagpipes, <laughs> and if I wear a kilt, I don't want nobody to judge me, all right? But, but, but when you think of what was lost, but brothers and sisters, but, it, but in spite of all of that, yet I believe the impact that it had on the black family has had the most negative impact, and the impact goes all the way back to Africa because it was there in the motherland where fathers, Mothers, brothers and sisters, children were stolen from their families never to be reunited. And now, uh, over 150 years uh, since slavery ended in this country, yet there are still forms of slavery that exist today which overwhelmingly impact the black family, in particularly the father. talking about mass incarceration. Listen, brothers and sisters, the 13th Amendment ratified in 1865, which officially abolished slavery, yet literally in its own terminology makes room for the continuation of slavery in other forms. It states, listen carefully, it states, neither slavery nor involuntary servitude except as a punishment for crime whereof the party shall have been duly convicted shall exist within the United States or any place subject to their jurisdiction. It literally says you can still be a slave if you've been convicted of a crime. I'll read it again. Neither slavery nor involuntary servitude except as a punishment for crime whereof the party shall have been duly convicted shall exist within the United States or any place subject to their jurisdiction. And right now in this country, sentencing uh, project, resort, project reports uh, how black Americans are incarcerated in state prisons at nearly five, time the ra five times the rate of white Americans. Nationally, hear this now, one in every one, 81, in every 81 black adults in the U.S. is serving time in a state prison. Pew Research showed how in 2017, blacks represent only 12% of the U.S. population, but 33% of the sentenced prison population. While whites accounted for 64% of adults, but only 30% of the prison population. And hear me now, and right now, there are many major companies, some of the very companies that you shop and buy, uh, may, even in the store or online, uh, are profiting uh, off of this system because uh, their products, as we speak, uh, are being made by inmates in prison uh, who are getting paid mere cents on the dollar, on, on the hour. Another form of slavery. Isn't it interesting how uh, in the 1980s and in the 1990s when crack cocaine ravaged uh, our black communities, uh, society's response uh, was to overcriminalize those communities? But now, all across this country, in rural towns and cities, especially in places like the Midwest where opioids are ravaging through white communities, that all of a sudden, drug abuse is no longer an issue of overcriminalization, but now it's a public health crisis. And 
And, 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 and hear me, brothers and sisters, don't miss the point. Because it truly is a public health crisis. Uh, and the point is this. Uh, it has always been a public health crisis. Uh, and it should have been treated that way uh, when it was just ravaging our communities. And all of this has done significant damage to our communities because in many ways it has destroyed our family structure. Research shows that fatherless children are more likely to experience poverty as adults compared with children from intact married homes. It shows that children who grow up without a father married to their mother often show signs of deep hurt which last into adulthood. And fatherless children are more prone to mental health issues including depression as adults. So you, you see, all of these statistics uh, are pointing to the impact, uh, not just as a child, uh, but even to adulthood. Uh, understand, brothers and sisters, uh, some of this stuff you just don't grow out of. And, and fatherless girls are more likely to engage in early sexual activity and suffer from relational instability as adults. While boys who grow up without a father often begin expressing their hurt and frustration outwardly and at a young age and those in single parent homes are even more likely to be diagnosed with ADHD. And boys uh, raised without a married father are much more likely uh, to use drugs, uh, engage in violent or criminal behavior, uh, go to jail, uh, and drop out of school. And brothers and sisters, there are also major spiritual implications for the lack of a father's presence as well. One startling bit of research conducted by the Christian Business Men's Committee, uh, and, and I'm not sure of the year, uh, it was done, uh, but it found the following. Hear me now. Uh, when the father is an active believer, uh, there is about a 75% likelihood uh, that the children uh, will also become active believers. But if only the mother is a believer, this likelihood will dramatically reduce, hear me now, to 15%. But that's why in spite of everything, we're in need of some good fathers in this society today. But understand the prerequisite for being a good father is you have to first be a good man. You can't be a good father without being a good man. And the psalmist gives us a good explanation of why this is the case. Uh, he says a good man's steps are ordered by the Lord. In other words, when a good man, uh, in other words, a good man uh, takes his direction from God. Uh, and because his directions come from God, uh, then he can't help but be a good father as well. And we thank God uh, for the good men, uh, the good fathers uh, that, we, that he has sent us here today. Uh, we thank God for the good men uh, that we have here at Community Worship Center. Uh, because uh, if we're ever going to be good fathers, uh, it first starts with being a good man. And I thank God for all of the good men that we have who have stepped into the role of a father to nurture and raise children uh, who are not biologically theirs. But they have a valued interest uh, in that child's life, uh, and we praise God for you. 
because good fathers, uh, good men uh, play an intricate role uh, in the development uh, and future success of their children. Uh, this is why the enemy uh, has placed such an attack uh, on the family structure. Uh, Satan uh, wants to destroy the family structure uh, because he knows the importance uh, of having the father in the home. But over the years, I've learned that all good men have a few things in common. And there are three characteristics that I want to share with you now that all good men have uh, that makes them good fathers as well. First off, good men are men who have learned how to lean. They've learned how to lean on the Lord. Proverbs chapter 3 verse 5 and 6 says, trust in the Lord uh, with all your heart uh, and lean not unto your own understanding, uh, but in all thy ways acknowledge him uh, and he shall direct thy paths. Good men are men who have learned to lean. They have learned to lean on the Lord. They lean on him for salvation. For by grace are you saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, because it is the gift of God. Brothers and sisters, one of the biggest issues with most men today is that men like to be in control. Let's be honest. We like to make things happen. We don't like to rely or ask for help. Uh, 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 in, in an article in Psychology Today, uh, it says, listen to what it says. It says, uh, men associate seeking assistance for a psychological or emotional problem with shame or weakness. Uh, admitting a problem and seeking help is perceived as being weak. Uh, our desire to be Superman is our kryptonite. But on the other hand, uh, women are typically more willing to seek help or willing to accept help uh, and don't view it as a sign of weakness. This could be one of the reasons why the church uh, overwhelmingly has more women than men in it. Because oftentimes it's easier uh, for a woman to simply let go uh, and rest in the Lord uh, and lean on him for salvation. But God, understanding this struggle uh, and this difference between men and women, uh, that's why he said in Matthew chapter 18, verse 3, uh, Verily I say unto you, uh, except ye be converted uh, and become as little children, uh, ye shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. Well, why must we become like little children? Well, it's because... As a child, even as a male child, children have such a sincere and authentic faith. They trust wholeheartedly. But it's somewhere along the way uh, between boyhood and manhood uh, where many of us as men uh, lose the ability to trust. Uh, we become skeptical uh, and therefore we begin to feel uh, that desire uh, that we have to be in control uh, and, to, and to lean on someone else uh, is a sign of weakness. But I thank God for the men who have learned in spite of it all, how to lean on God for salvation. Because no matter how challenging it may be for us as men, uh, yet with God, all things are possible. And I thank God for the men uh, who he has given this childlike faith again uh, that enables them to be able to lean on him. But not only do good men lean on him for salvation, but they also lean on him for strength. This is a tough one. And as parents and adults, we are partly, we must, we are partly to blame. We train our boys to be warriors and to have warrior mentalities. Society for a long time taught us that boys aren't supposed to cry because that's a sign of weakness. But you got to be tough. You got to be strong. If a little girl falls and cries, 
we pick them up because they are a princess. But if a boy falls and cries, we tell them to get up and shake it off, you'll be all right. We have to a degree train boys this way, especially in our black communities, but then we wonder why it's so difficult for them as grown men now to give their life to the Lord. When in order to do that, uh, you have to be willing to submit yourself to him, uh, to be vulnerable. Uh, your strength is not in being strong, uh, but is actually in your ability uh, to be vulnerable, uh, to show weakness. That's real strength. But this goes against everything uh, that most men have ever been taught. Uh, and that's why it's difficult for so many of them uh, to make the connection uh, and better yet make the transition. But I thank God for the men that we have here who have made that connection, uh, who have made that transition, uh, who have come to a point in life uh, where they realize that they can't make it all by themselves uh, and we need help from a higher power. I thank God for the men who understand the words of Isaiah when he said, even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall, but they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. But not only do good men lean on him for strength, but they also lean on him for supply. Paul says, my God shall supply all of your needs according to his riches in Christ Jesus. As a man, it's natural to want to be the breadwinner, the hunter, the provider for his family. But as men, we can only fulfill this role successfully as long as we recognize and understand our inadequacies outside of God. In other words, we can't do it by ourselves. And even as men, we have to see our own selves as being in God's hands. And I thank God for the men who have learned how to lean on him for all of their needs, for all of their family's needs. And lastly, not only do good men lean on him for their supply, but they also lean on him for soundness. In other words, they lean on him for reasoning and wisdom. I know as men, we don't always like to admit uh, this, but the truth of the matter is we really don't know everything. We don't always have the answer. And we don't always know the directions of where we're trying to get. But the Bible says, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God uh, that give it to all men liberally. And I thank God for all of the good men uh, who have enough sense uh, to lean on him for soundness, uh, or to, who lean on him for reasoning and wisdom. These men are men of prayer. Uh, these men are prayer warriors. Uh, and understand today, men, uh, if we're going to be a warrior, uh, that's the kind of warrior we need to be a warrior who prays over his family, who prays over his wife, who prays over his children, who prays over his church, who prays over his pastor. But not only are good men, men who've learned how to lean, but secondly, good men are men who've learned how to lead. Good men are men who have learned how to lead their flesh. Galatians chapter 5 verse 16 and 70 says, this I say then, walk in the spirit. and Ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary the one to the other, so that ye cannot do the things that ye would. Then Galatians chapter 2 verse 20 says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Let me simplify it, men. We have to lead our flesh or our flesh will lead us. 
but men who have learned how to lead their flesh. Uh, in other words, they are not controlled by their flesh. Uh, their inner passions, uh, their ungodly desires and wants. Uh, Jesus understands the power of the flesh. Uh, that's why he told his disciples uh, to watch and pray uh, that ye enter not into temptation. Uh, for the spirit is de indeed is willing, uh, but the flesh is weak. Men, the flesh is weak. And if we don't lead it, it will lead us. But understand today that the only way to lead your flesh is to give it to Jesus uh, because this is a battle that we can't win on our own. Because we were born into sin and shaped uh, in iniquity. Uh, and we need the power of the Holy Spirit uh, to give us the victory. And even though all of us have fallen uh, at some point or another, uh, yet I thank God for the men, uh, who, men uh, who have gotten back up uh, and who understand the power uh, of the Holy Spirit uh, and are now leading their flesh uh, and not being led by, uh, not being controlled by it. But not only do good men know how to lead their flesh, but they also know how to lead their family. Ephesians chapter 5 verse 23 says, For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Good men know how to lead their families. But understand, brothers, this headship or leadership is not a perks-driven privilege as much as it is a responsibility. Because understand, leadership is not about getting what you want, but it's about submitting to the will of God. We are to be the head of the wife, uh, even as Christ is the head of the church. As the leader of the church, uh, Christ gave himself up for her. Uh, and in the same way, the husband, uh, the father, uh, should place a greater value uh, on his wife and family's life uh, and well-being uh, than over even his own life. Because we lead our families, brothers, uh, by serving and sacrificing uh, and pointing our families uh, to the one true ruler of the family, uh, which is God Almighty. And understand today that this is a serious responsibility. Eli could lead the temple, but he could not lead his family. David could lead a kingdom and lead men into battle. But he could not lead his children. But I thank God today for the good men here who have stepped up to the plate uh, and have fulfilled your responsibility in leading your family, uh, being the husband that your wife needs, uh, being the father that your children need, uh, a good man uh, and a good father. But then lastly, not only have good men are good men, men who have learned how to lean. And not only are they men who have learned how to, how to lead, but then thirdly, good men are men who have learned how to love. They love the Father. The greatest commandment is this. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. Good men love God more than anything or anything uh, anyone else. Good men put God first in life. Uh, these are the type of men who declare that as for me and my house, uh, we will serve the Lord. Uh, these men choose God over their careers, uh, over money and fame, uh, over their lust and desires. Uh, I tell you, I thank God for men uh, who have learned how to love the Lord. Uh, these are the men who are sold out for Jesus. But not only do good men love the Lord, but they also love their families. The Bible says, husband, love your wives. Now, on the surface, this may seem like an odd request because most people are thinking, well, if he didn't love her, he wouldn't have married her in the first place. But understand that love here means more than just mere affection. It means more than just an emotional feeling or satisfaction. 
but it means, brothers, that you are going to seek the welfare and happiness of the person you are going to love and lead them lovingly. That means that my effort will be to make the object of my love happy, secure, and comfortable. And this goes well beyond uh, God just telling the husband uh, to love his wife uh, as long as she is beautiful and lovely. Uh, but it signifies love for better or for worse, uh, for richer or for poorer, uh, in sickness and in health, uh, till death do us part. You see, a good man will love and cherish his wife. And he'll be there every step of the way, raising and rearing his children, uh, giving them the love uh, that they so need and deserve. And I thank God for the good men we have here who every day fulfill that role. Uh, but not only do good men love the father and love their family, but they also love the fellowship. In other words, they love the church. <laughs> Christ loved the church, and he gave his life for it. Just as Christ loved his church, uh, he expects us to love his church uh, just the same, especially as men. Every person, hear me now, every person plays an important role in the church. But one of the things that I have learned, brothers and sisters, over the years, however, is that oftentimes it's the dedication of the men which determines the strength of the church. Now listen, this doesn't mean that men have to be in all of the leadership positions of the church or even be the pastor. It doesn't mean that they have to be in the majority. But studies suggest that the presence of enthusiastic men is one of the surest predicators of church health, growth, giving, and expansion. Meanwhile, a man's shortage is a sure sign of congregational paralysis and decline. The devil understands and knows this. Uh, that's why uh, he's trying with all his might uh, to keep men out of the church. Uh, but I thank God today uh, that we have some soldiers here, uh, some men who are on the battlefield for the Lord, uh, men who promised him uh, that, they, that you would serve him until you die, uh, men who are sold out and dedicated uh, to the church of God, uh, who love the church, uh, who will stand for the church, uh, who will sacrifice for the church. I thank God for the good men who are good fathers, fathers in their homes uh, and fathers in their church, uh, fathers in their neighborhoods, uh, fathers in their community. Uh, anybody here got a good father? You ought to praise God uh, for the godly father in your life uh, because uh, he's a good man. Uh, salt and pepper once said, what a man, what a man, what a man, what a mighty good man. Uh, he's a man that provided for you, that raised you up, uh, that fought battles for you, that defended your honor. Uh, he's a man who when he came home tired, uh, he still played with you, uh, helped you with your heart homework. Uh, he kissed your bruises uh, and blocked knuckleheads uh, from getting too close. Uh, but some of you here today, maybe you were just like me uh, and you never grew up with an earthly father. Uh, but when I think about all of the good earthly fathers, uh, I can't help but think of my heavenly father. Uh, can I tell you about my heavenly father? Uh, he's been a shepherd uh, who makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. When I have to walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I don't have to fear. For my God is with me and he comforts me. He prepares a table for me in the very presence of the very people 
that hate me and want to do me harm. He anoints me to the extent that I begin to overflow. Because my cup runneth over, I thank God for my heavenly Father. He's a provider, a caretaker. He's a burden bearer and a heavy load carrier. He's a lawyer in the courtroom. He's a doctor in the sick room. He's a deliverer and redeemer. He's a comforter and watchtower. He's a midnight companion when I'm all alone. And he's a light in darkness. I'm talking about my father. He's a father that withholds nothing from me. So much that he was willing to give up my big brother. Jesus is his name. To die on an old rugged cross. So that I might live. But I'm glad that my big brother did not stay dead. Because three days later, my heavenly father raised him from the grave. And now, even though you may not have an earthly father, but yet one day soon and very soon, you'll be able to see your heavenly father. That's why the songwriter said, soon and very soon, we're going to see the king. No more crying there, because I'm going to see my daddy. No more dying there, because we're going to see our daddy. We're going to see our king. Should there be any rivers we must cross? Should there be any mountains we must climb? God will supply all the strength that we need and give us grace till we reach the other side. We have come from every nation. God knows each of us by name. Jesus took his blood and he washed our sins away. He washed them all away. Yes, there are some of us who will lay down our lives, but we all shall live again on the other side. Because soon and very soon, I said soon and very soon, we are going to see the king. I'm going to see my daddy. I'm going to see my father. I never knew my earthly father, but I had a father watching over me. And that's why I can stand here today and preach this gospel. Because my God watched over me. He kept me. He's still keeping me. He lifted me. And he healed me. Hallelujah. In this place, we're going to see the king. We're going to see our father. Ain't he all right? Ain't he all right? I said, ain't he all right? I know he's all right. I know he's all right. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Ain't he worthy? Hallelujah. Hallelujah in this place. Thank God.
for the good fathers. The good fathers that all of you have had. And maybe there are some fathers here today. Men, hear me. You've heard this message. And you know for a fact that you have not been the best father that your children need. It's not too late to start today. Because your sons, your daughters, don't need to go through the statistics again. Many will leave the church because your presence is not there. Even though you may be in the church. Brothers and sisters, I know what I'm talking about. My grandmother, you hear me talk about a lot. Had 12 children. My mom was number seven out of the 12. Seven boys and five girls. My grandmother is the best Christian I know I've ever seen. May she rest in peace. But my grandfather was not in the church. None of the seven boys who were raised in the church are in the church today. And only three of the girls are consistent. Because the father, even though he was in the home, yeah, he wasn't in the faith. So your presence, your commitment to God, and your family makes a difference. Y'all hear me today? So my appeal is simple. It's just for the men today. I don't know the status of how any of you are in terms of your relationship with your children, families. But if you want to just say, and maybe you even have a good one. But if you want to make men, if you want to make the commitment today that you're going to be better. Doesn't mean you've been bad. But you're making the commitment today on this Father's Day that I want to be better for my family. I want to be better for my children. And those who are married, I want to be better for my spouse. You're here today. I just want you to stand with me, men, wherever you are. Amen. 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 Now, this appeal is not just for the men, it's for anyone. Part of that transformation starts with learning how to lean on the Lord. And so maybe there's a man here today. Maybe there's a woman here today who heard this message. But realized, realize that if you're ever going to be all you can be in life, if you're really ever going to have that 
connection with God the way that he wants. It starts with making the commitment today saying, I'm making the decision that I want to, I'm, 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 I'm going to stop trying to do it my way. But from this day forward, I'm going to lean on him. But some that may mean just making a simple recommitment. For others, that may mean a deeper commitment in the form of baptism. For some, it may mean making a commitment. You know what? Man, I showed up today because it's Father's Day. But I know I ain't been really connected coming to the church. Studying, reading my Bible, praying like I should. I'm going to make that commitment today. But wherever it is, if you're here, and that's you today, and my elders are in the aisle, and they have a card for you to fill out. It says if you want baptism on it, if you want someone to contact you, even if it's just something, man, pastor, I'm ready to get committed. Elder, I'm ready to get committed, but how do I start? And you want us to contact you. Set you up in Bible studies or just special prayer. And you're here today, but you're saying, I, I want to make that commitment. I want to lean on him. I want you to raise your hand, whoever you are. You could be a man or a woman. I see a hand right here. And just fill that card out, and then you can give it right back to the elder. Anyone else, just raise that hand. Just raise your hand. So that we can acknowledge you. Men, don't allow your pride to stop you on this day. When God has convicted your heart that you need to lean on him. So wherever you are, just raise that hand. As we're filling out the cards, we'll wait just a couple more moments. And then we'll close in prayer. Still time, just raise that hand. Let's bow our heads. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you. We thank you because you're an awesome God. We thank you, God, for the men here at CWC. We thank you, God, for those who are standing today. Response to this appeal. Not an acknowledgement of Man, I've really been a bad father, a bad husband, a bad man. But just an acknowledgement today that I know there's room for me to grow. And I can be better. We thank you, God, for their decision, their willingness to stand. Not worried about who's looking, but to make that commitment today. And we're praying, God, that you would honor that commitment now. And that you would strengthen our men here in this church. God, I pray even now for the men. God, if there's a father here who for whatever reason, God, is hurting today because they want to be in their child's life. They want to be in their children's life. But for a myriad of reasons, could have been a way a relationship ended or the way the system uh, is working, that, that God is, 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 is blocking them from, from having the connection and relationship, God, that they want to have, so desperately desire for their children. God, we pray, God, that you would move upon that situation, that if you have to soften hearts, that you would soften. That, God, that you would do the, what seems impossible, that you would work it out, God, so that their relationship with their, family, their children can be restored. And we thank you, God, for the hands that went up. Response for...
the decision today. And the cars that have been filled out saying, God, I, I'm choosing on this day that I want to lean on you. We pray, God, that you would bless that individual and, and, and God lead them around, God, down the path of righteousness. In your name we pray. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, and amen. Number 334, come thou fount of every blessing.
forth into the world in peace, dedicated to your service, O oh Lord. Let us hold fast to that which is good, render to no person evil for evil, strengthen the faint-hearted, support the weak, help the needy and the afflicted, and honor all people. Help us to love and serve you, Lord, rejoicing in the power of your spirit. And may your blessing be upon us and remain with us always. Amen. be seated. Elders, please remember to meet with pastor in the office as soon as we have exited the sanctuary and pastor has shake, shaken the hands of the members.
Dads are special. They're a daughter's first love and a son's first hero. They rocked us in their strong arms when we were babies, held our small hands on the first day of school, and blinked back tears when they let us go after dropping us off at college or walking us down the aisle. So much of who we are and who we will become is because of Dad. His impact will last as long as we live. It's hard to be a good dad. So this Father's Day, be thankful for yours. Squeeze his hand or give him a call just to tell him thanks, to tell him you love him, to tell him you're glad that he's your dad. In six days, God created the heavens and the earth. For thousands of years, man has worshiped God on the seventh day of the week. Now, each week, millions of people worship on the first day. What happened? Why did God create a day of rest? Does it really matter what day we worship? Who is behind this great shift? Discover the truth behind God's law and how it was changed. Visit SabbathTruth.com.